Hey, it's Ben. Um, just coming back not too long ago from um, another time on the mountain. <clears throat> Part of my training, give you a little background, is um, I spent a number of years training with one of the last surviving traditional doctors among the Kiowa tribe, uh, Horace Dalkai. And um, but going even further back, <clears throat> from early childhood, I had this fascination with uh, Native Americans and actually other groups of indigenous people as well. And I think some of my earliest memories were being parked in front of the television set as you know, a lot of us were, or our parents used the television as a babysitter. <clears throat> but when there were the cowboy and Indian movies on, and especially when the native folks were getting killed, I would just be screaming and throwing fits. And <clears throat> it was very upsetting to me. And conversely, <laughs> when when the natives were winning and, um, um, you know, Custer's last stand and they were firing those arrows into Custer and his men or whatever, you know, I'd be like, yeah, get them, get them. But in any case, <clears throat> that... Um, whatever it was, that um, connection or that pull stayed with me as I was growing through childhood into adolescence. And I remember at one point reading this book, uh, Black Elk Speaks, and, you know, just, and reading this account of uh, Lakota, uh, traditional doctor, and his experience of going through the vision quest and and at that early age like 14 i was like thinking to myself saying to myself if given the opportunity this is what i'm going to do with my life <laughs> and i had no way of knowing how that would ever be possible but within a year's time i was um saving as much money as i could from whatever jobs i could get at that that time and and <clears throat> I started making plans. So by the time I was 17, I was headed out on my own. I still had a year of high school left. Thinking I would head to Arizona, get into boarding school out there, at least I could complete high school, but um, my car didn't carry me that far. It only made it as far as um, Oklahoma. And so I ended up living in this community of predominantly Kiowa, uh, Kiowa, Apache, Comanche Indians in um, um, southwestern Oklahoma. Um, and I graduated from high school there in Carnegie, later went on to college at Chickasha. But <clears throat> during the, um, my senior year of high school and first two years of college there, I spent inordinate amounts of time with some of the Kiowa elders, especially this one elder, Jack. I would just sit for hours on end and he would be sharing these accounts of like these uh, traditional native doctors and some of the, the gifts that they possessed. The doctors, the warriors, I mean, a lot of them actually possessed various paranormal abilities even. And, and I just, you know, he was sharing how, you know, they would go on the vision quest, you know, where they'd go out for, say, like a period of uh, four days and nights, no food, no water, they're alone in the mountains. And these other forces or beings would come to them. And, and you know, when you're out there fasting, I mean, sometimes you suffer like hell without the food and water. But, and a lot of people have asked me over the years, like, why do you have to go without water? And But the native elders would say that in making that sacrifice, you know, where you're fasting without the food and water, there's um, um, those beings, those forces have compassion for you. And they would um, bestow upon you in part these uh these gifts and there were all kinds of different gifts or powers that these individuals possessed um now in many instances these gifts or healing powers were passed down 
um, through the generations, you know, um, often in families or like if you had like a, one of the older traditional doctors would um, towards the end of his or her life would take a portion or all of that transmission of power and transmit it to a younger apprentice. But the, they would say that you couldn't just say, take the ball and run with it. You actually had to earn the right to work with these gifts of healing for them to work properly. And so they said, in order to do so, you had to go through the vision quest where you would go out you know, that fasting. And, and it varies. I mean, some people might fast two days, and I've known people to fast as long as seven days and nights without food and water. And I know some people would say that, is that even humanly possible? Is it safe? Um, yeah, actually, there's a order of uh, Buddhist monks in Japan. They, they push the limits. And they go up to uh, nine days and nights fasting uh, without food and water. Um, I think they pushed it to the very limit. Was, from what I heard, it was day 10 when some of them started actually dying or something. But And that case a number of uh, years ago uh, in Florida where um, Terry Shivo was in a um, comatose state or whatever, and her husband was fighting to remove her from life support. It actually took about 11 days for her to expire. But in any case, uh, well, details there. But um, again, being, you know, getting into Oklahoma at the age of 17 and, and just, I think some of the people in the community, I think they were legitimately concerned for my safety, <laughs> my well-being. <laughs> so, so some of these um, um, native people, you know, <laughs> some of the elders especially, <laughs> were like really looking out for me and uh, wanting to keep me out of trouble and making sure that I was okay. But um, <clears throat> this native elder that I mentioned earlier that I spent so much time with, Jack, and he was at the time the president of they call the Kiowa chapter of the Native American Church, which is uh, where they conduct peyote meetings. So Jack pretty much you know took me in, and he really looked after me. And as I said, I spent inordinate amounts of time with him. I was so captivated by all the accounts that he would share with me. But I would go into the peyote meetings with Jack, and and. That was, for me, a very powerful and magical experience, even. And it was that last generation of Kiowa elders that still had a really firm grasp on the language. And there's such a powerful presence in the teepee during the peyote meetings. I remember at one point where um, Jack was telling me about, um, he said, sometimes when the spirit comes into the peyote meeting that you'll hear the voice of a woman singing in Kiowa. And I remember one night where I start hearing this voice and I'm like looking around like, where is this voice coming from? There's one Kiowa woman in the, the teepee and she's quite elderly. It wouldn't be humanly possible for her to sing with such a beautiful voice. And the other woman in the teepee that night was Navajo, and she probably doesn't didn't understand a word of Kiowa, maybe a few words or something. But um, so it would have these like really powerful ex experiences, visionary experiences at times. And then in times past, there were many extraordinarily powerful doctors. And but as the years went on, you know, like they were taking the native children and shipping them off to boarding schools. And um, many of these children were subject, subjected to, um, you know, they were sexually abused. And uh, some of them didn't survive. I mean, they. Um, um, there were numerous burials around some of these boarding schools in the United States and Canada. And some of the older doctors, as they were getting towards the end of their lives, you know, they, they desperately wanted to pass on their gifts of healing. But there, was, um, there wasn't anyone that um, 
in some instances that was either willing to, to take or receive these gifts of healing or um, in some instances they were, you know, they would see a young child and they would try to attempt to pass on this transmission of this healing power, this gift. But in many instances, it was just too much for the child. And so they would take the, um, you know, take that gift back. In many instances, they took it to the grave with them. So there, it wasn't passed on. And so much of this knowledge, many of these gifts of healing, other kinds of powers, it was just, it was lost. But <clears throat> Again, there were different types of gifts of healing. I mean, some people or some of the native doctors, they had they all had their areas of specialization. Some were treating primarily, you know, say, like maybe neurological issues or uh, um, you know, digestive or respiratory um, and such. But there are other kinds of gifts as well. Like some had the ability to um, evoke some kind of power that could bring the rain. They could um, uh, had some protection so that um, they could go into battle without being uh, wounded or killed. I mean, there are these accounts of you know some of these uh, warriors would have these huge war bonnets and they'd go charging into the midst of a battle, and all these um, feathers on the war bonnet would be like shot out. You know, would be clipped. You know, by the in the hail of bullets and yet some of these uh warriors possessed that power were so strong that there wasn't a scratch on their body uh, some of them had a, a gift of healing where they could extract the projectile the bullet or arrow and they could literally seal the wound um this is fairly common among some of the native american tribes where people possess these gifts and abilities it's not just Native Americans. It's you know in countries like Brazil, um, and you know you have traditions of healers. Also in the Philippines, there's traditions where these healers have the ability to reach into the body to remove tumors and do all kinds of other amazing things. But um, yeah, so again, I would be going into the peyote meetings, and it was during the meetings that I met my mentor, Horace. Uh, Horace Dolkai, again, he was one of the last surviving traditional doctors among the Kiowa tribe. And I was around the time of my junior year in high school, my grades were starting to go down because at some level I knew I just wasn't doing what I needed to be doing with my life. So I had spoken with I, two of my friends, uh, George and Tim, you know, who are both Kiowa. And, and you know they both encouraged me and so i was very um as terrified um, i was like horace would say something like you're white this only works for native people i can't teach you anything but <clears throat> i kept going by um the cousin's house where horace would stay and um and he came out and he I just um, physically shaking, and I just said, "I want to learn to do what you're doing." And he didn't say yes or no. He just says, um, "Well, can you start fasting?" And and I'm still like physically, I'm trembling, my body, and uh, I just said, uh, "Yeah, sure." <laughs> and so he had me drive down into the Wichita mountains, and not a whole lot happened during that two days and nights, at least not that I was aware of, but um, unless it was happening on some other level. But in any case, um, you know, he had me come out. Uh, he told me to come out and stay with him. Um, he was living on the Navajo reservation with his wife and children at that time. And um, but <clears throat> apprenticing with Horace was pretty intense. I mean, he would, um, again, a lot of these native doctors possess paranormal gifts or abilities, and uh, he would actually take physical objects like the end of a feather, and he would like um, project it into my body, stand in front of me, project it into my body. I would go into something akin to a seizure, and 
Sometimes I'm a bit hesitant to relate some of the experiences I had because, you know, if you've grown up in what I call wonder bread society here, where it's uh, just all white and devoid of nutrients, then you don't have any point of reference for these kinds of experiences because you've never witnessed or experienced them firsthand. So I don't know, some people think I'm making stuff up, but whatever, if you, if you go out and you live among some of these indigenous groups of people, you can even travel down to Brazil or the Philippines or uh, Indonesia or something, some remote areas, you'll see and experience people doing some pretty amazing things. So um, <clears throat> I don't care if you're skeptical, just keep an open mind because there's a lot more that's possible than what most people imagine or conceive of. But anyway, uh, Horace would transmit portions of his own healing gifts, and then he would like, um, he'd have me fasting. Um, he had me out in the desert area in southwestern Colorado, and there were all these Anasazi ruins around in the area where I was fasting. And, um, <clears throat> and I spent uh, about three years training with Horace, and um, you know, he would continue to do more of these transmissions and, you know, have me fasting and going through all kinds of other ordeals. But um, things got a little uh, chaotic um, after some time. Again, Horace, uh, of all the healers I've ever met, encountered, is by far the most powerful. He's extraordinarily gifted. I've never seen anybody um, who could... You couldn't hide anything from him. I mean, get into an argument, he'd rebut what you were going to say before the words could come out of your mouth. But um, but on some other levels, he didn't really understand how to deal with his own emotional wounding. And when you possess that kind of power and you're not dealing with your own emotional wounding, that, that power just... Uh, filter, you know, your body and mind, your psyche is the filter through which that that power flows, and so um, that can create a lot of distortion. So, uh, toward the end of that time, it was a bit chaotic. It would be like being in day and night simultaneously, a string of miracles on one hand, people that were healing, but a lot of chaos, and uh, sometimes he was a bit destructive and. I became fearful and just kind of um, disappeared because <laughs> I didn't know what else to do. I was just, you know, what, 21 at the time, I think. And, um, or no, 23, hard to keep track of years. Anyway, um, so there's this period of time where I was just like wandering and just kind of, you know, I'd received these gifts of healing from Horace. He transmitted some of that to me. And I was, um, had started working with people. But when you take um, that kind of transmission of power, and that began to awaken within me, it was like pouring hydrogen peroxide into an open wound, open infected wound, because a lot of the traumas of my childhood and adolescence, that was all coming out. And I was reenacting much of that in my adult, uh, romantic, intimate, or not so intimate uh, at that time relationships. And <clears throat> I had the opportunity during that time to work with some powerfully gifted healers, but they just didn't come around very often. Every session really helped that I did, but you know, I'd have to wait inordinate amounts of time from one session to the next, like six months, a year, year and a half. But around the time I turned uh, 30, I was thinking like you know, a lot of these native doctors, the way they develop these, uh, are received or possess these amazing gifts of healing and other capabilities, whatever, is they went through the vision quest. And so I was feeling that pull, like, you know, like, like, something deep within like i don't know if it was my own inner being or some kind of presence or something that was you know like talking to me or something but in any case um i started reaching back out to some friends in oklahoma 
And one of them, you know, after I spoke with them, he said, yeah, you know, come out, you know, I'll, I'll help you out. And, um, and <clears throat> so I remember that first time uh, going out to fast in the Wichita mountains and I was totally unprepared. I had this uh, sleeping bag that was totally inadequate and cold front came blasting through and I was like absolutely freezing my ass off on the side of the mountain <laughs> on the north face and but um but I made it and um, I remember some people talking about how they could see and feel this presence um coming uh off of me uh afterwards and are emanating from me but then um first time I, I waited a year and um god when was this this is like back in 1993 and then um but that seemed like just too long of a time to go and i started going back twice a year um and it's intense getting through those four days and nights i mean the hardest part is being without the water but yeah uh but being out there you know it's like sometimes it's and you're getting rained on and i've gotten really sunburned a lot of times way too many times um <clears throat> and it just stayed wet for days when it did rain and snowed on buried under like six eight inches of snow and it's gone up into the 90s and you know without water you're just concerned about dehydration and then there's other times where it's trapped down into the teens and i'm just absolutely freezing my ass off up there and i would literally i'd have to like um lift one foot up and uh hold on to those toes with my opposite hand until they thawed out then i would switch the other hand another set of toes and go back and forth until i just passed out from exhaustion and then when i came to again i'd start again and but yeah it's intense to get through sometimes again you know people ask why do you have to go through all this and as i said native elders would say that when you when you go through this uh, you make this sacrifice you know you're putting yourself out there because you want to receive some kind of gift or healing power in a sense where you can help yourself and you can help other people and those forces those beings they look upon you and they have compassion and so then they would um, transmit to you this gift of healing Native people would refer to these forces or being sometimes as helper spirits. And there are times when I'm on the mountain where I feel some intensely powerful presence come to me, like just basically like descend into my body. So it feels like this kind of possession in a way, but it's a very uh, extraordinarily pleasant experience. Although there are moments though where it's so intense, where my body is thrashing around and I feel like I'm about to just jump right out of my skin. <clears throat> and um, you know, again, I'm referring to this forces or beings. I mean, it's part of the reason you see this like uh, the side, this image here, <laughs> you know, because the native people uh, in the Southwest would scratch these images into the rocks, uh, known as uh, referred to as petroglyphs, and <clears throat> and all these. Um, native doctors are basically like conduits you know they allow this extraordinarily powerful presence to work through them to facilitate healing that would not otherwise be possible you know you think about it like native people they're living in the wild and so they had this extraordinarily close relationship with nature and and so they they were interacted with they relied upon these forces or beings to again facilitate healing and to um, oh, for protection, to um, help them uh, have some control over the weather, even to draw the rain. Uh, there are accounts among some of the Kiowa elders who talk about it, like um, in the Midwest, as you know, is uh, Tornado Alley. And there are these accounts of these elders who, tornadoes like cruising through and this elder would, um, you know, or different ones that go out at times and just speak with the tornado and let's say veer off in a completely different direction or something 
was, Jack was telling me the story about this elder and you know he's saying these prayers and asking Cornelio to go in the opposite direction and, and his wife says no our, our, our son lives over in that direction and, and then he starts again and said no go over this way and his, and his wife's like um, uh, no this, this other family are living over there and so the old guy's like oh, hell with you just go where, go wherever you want I don't care and turns around and walks off um, I don't know. Their sense of humor was um, pretty unique. But anyway, um, one thing I, I didn't realize though, I started going to do the vision quest, is I carried a great deal of trauma from my own childhood and adolescence. And so there are so many times when I've been on the mountain that. Um, and I would feel that presence come into my body. And at times it was like a near death experience. I would be reliving these events that had occurred um, years or often decades earlier. In many instances, I had no conscious recollection of having experienced those events and be like, it would all be coming back up and I'd be remembering it in great vivid detail. Even if I did remember it, it was like, as I was reliving it, it was so intense, so vivid. It, you know, all the emotions were coming back, all the sensory impressions, everything I saw and felt. And yeah, so it was like, you know, living that experience all over again. Uh, but the amazing thing though, it's like I could feel these um, traumas uh, or deeply wounding experiences being uh, transformed. Uh, it was like that those beings, those forces were helping me to digest those experiences. <clears throat> and so each time that happened is like I was coming out the other side and I was feeling that much lighter. It was like having, um, you know, healed and transformed this big chunk of wounding that I've been carrying, that I've been living in my body for years or decades, whatever. And <clears throat> In many ways, I was, um, I've been very dissociated. And my mentor, Horace, of all, again, of all the healers, I have never seen anyone as extraordinarily powerful as he was in his day. Um, but he didn't understand, as I said, the emotional component so much. And so sometimes he would get irritated at me because I was like kind of spacey and ungrounded. And so, he, Put me through all these ordeals to like you know get your ass in your body <laughs> and um <clears throat> but as i'd go through the vision quest you know each time i go it's like and more and more of that trauma is healing it would just pull more and more of me into my body instead of dissociated i was like becoming you know grounded rooted in my body and when you uh, carry a lot of this trauma, you know, it's that term uh, development arrested, you know, so I hadn't developed a lot of resources I really needed to function in different areas of my life. And so as I'd be, each time I'd be going back to the mountain and it's like, you know, not only would I be healing and transforming more of that emotional wounding or trauma, it's like I could feel, um, there's just a lot more of me here and new resources or capabilities were emerging. Um, one of the unfortunate consequences, uh, maybe that's a matter of perspective, you know, because we learn through our traumas as we heal them. But in any case, um, <clears throat> in um, uh, going through the vision quests, it's, a, well, the trauma that I suffered, my early models of attachment through which I formed relationships, like uh, kinds of women that I would be attracted to, or in many instances, like uh, reflected my early childhood adolescent trauma. And it was, those relationships were reenactments of that trauma. So I'd go through all these times on the mountain and each time it was like, um, 
going in to like reconfigure those patterns. It was uh, progressively in stages over time, building a whole new foundation. So as that happened, quality of my relationships improved dramatically. And so I, you know, over time, um, just outgrew a lot of the um, unhealthy attachments, evolved beyond them. And I started attracting companions with whom I could um, co-create healthier, more meaningful, more deeply fulfilling relationships. So for me, this has been an ongoing process of evolution. Um, I know like a lot of people, you know, um, would come say to work with me individually or to work with other healers and they'll do one or a few sessions, which it's like, what, you know, I mean, you have this, um, these conditions that manifest in your body and uh, emotional wounding that you carry is many years or many decades in the making and you haven't really done anything much you know to really or just a limited amount to address that hold on that let me drink so it's a little scratchy but in any case one or a few sessions i mean it's just barely enough to scratch the surface um, once I started going to the mountain, um, or back to the mountain and first time I waited a year, but then I've been like clockwork, you know, all these years, um, started in 93, waited a year. And then after that, it's like twice a year. So you can do the math and figure out how many times that is. Um, <clears throat> but it's, and also having trained for years with a master from China, and Xing Yi Quan, Bagua Zhang, Tai Chi, Qigong. And in these traditions, the people who attain mastery, they don't just dabble in healing like people in our Wonder Bread culture here. I mean, they it's very intensive discipline. And it's just year after year after year, just uh, intensive practice in these individuals who attain mastery. It's like you just keep developing to higher and higher levels. Um, People who uh, are, many people over the years have asked me about going to do the vision quest and well, um, it's possible. Um, I'm not really in a position where I can facilitate for another person at this point because it's, it's a tremendous amount of responsibility, um, commitment, I mean, I would basically have to take off and drop everything else and just be there and check on the person daily and um, and just and make sure that um, the person's um, in good shape to to go through such a intense or arduous process. There is a, a friend some years ago that I mean, I was doing sessions for him. I think I'd worked with him for a year and a half. And so he went on the first vision quest and he had recently come out of a breakup. But after he came off the mountain, he went from sleeping from um, eight to nine hours a night down to two to three. I mean, he had so much power going through his body. Saw his ex-girlfriend, he had so much intense emotion welling up. He literally jumped up and ran out of the restaurant because he was having cold sweats and he felt like he was going to pass out. And um, and one block or one one day he walked around the same block 20 times because he was just, just overwhelmed with all the emotion coming out of him. So <clears throat> after the second time he went to the mountain, it was... Um, his asthma kicked in so bad he felt like he was suffocating. I said, well, um, go see an acupuncturist till I get back in town. Maybe that will help to stabilize your system. He didn't listen, but I got back to town and um, worked with him. And, and the, his uh, asthma cleared up and the um, cat allergies cleared up. He actually had a cat sleeping in his bed with him because he got over the cat allergies. Mm. Um, but so a lot of people, they would, um, if, if they were to go on the vision quest, they would need to build up to it. It, it is a very intense thing to go through. Um, 
I find is that as I work with people individually, it helps to build that foundation because you need to do a lot of groundwork where you're, um, you know, working through a lot of that emotional wounding, healing it and um, building the infrastructure so you have the capacity to handle that kind of power. <clears throat> Other thing is that, you know, if, if you feel especially drawn, it would be good to, you um, actually spend time, you know, living among um, some of the native indigenous groups here in the United States or Central or South America. Um, although the traditions in um, Central and South America are very different, I'm not quite so familiar with them. Um, <clears throat> and even um, some of the tribes on the East or West Coast, I'm not so familiar with their practices or whatever, but um, <clears throat> yeah, if you feel drawn to um, go on a vision quest again, you know, spend time living among uh, native groups of people, you know, who are still practicing these sorts of things, which is unfortunate thing is much of this is dying out and not that many people are, are still doing it anymore. Um, <clears throat> I work as a conduit, you know, like the fact that I trained with my mentor, Horace, he passed on um, portions of his own healing gifts to me. And having gone through the vision quest so many times, like each time I go, not only is it healing my own wounding, my own past traumas, but as I go, then I continue to receive other kinds of gifts. Uh, and that's expanded the range of um what i can work with so you know working with people with uh respiratory digestive disorders heart disease stroke um people uh, helping people to recover from injuries uh, sports injuries are those sustained in automobile accidents uh, including traumatic brain injuries and um and also helping a lot of people struggling with depression, anxiety, or that have, um, um, are in the midst of a breakup or divorce or, you know, dealing with patterns of abandonment, rejection, unrequited love, um, all that stuff. So, um, yeah, so if, um, when you feel the need, um, you could always reach out to me there. But there's some, um, so much to say, and I haven't referred back to my notes at all, but hopefully I've included everything that I needed to, to say for this time. So I'll wrap up this broadcast. If, um, if you do have questions, you can reach out to me. Um, and um, bye for now. <clears throat>